Hi guys, Miss Davis here, back for day 36 of the Anne Frank series. And so, today, um, I want to jump right in where we left off yesterday. The war really starts to pick up and accelerate, and almost all the journal entries we're going to read today are about the war and how it is increasingly affecting the lives of Anne and the people in the secret annex and the people just outside of the secret annex. It's reaching a real crisis point and a fever pitch at this point in the novels and I want to cover quite a bit so I'm going to jump right in. Um, the journal entry is Thursday the 25th of May 1944. Dear Kitty, there's something fresh every day. This morning our vegetable man was picked up for having two Jews in his house. It's a great blow to us. Not only that those poor Jews are balancing on the edge of an abyss, but it's terrible for the man himself. The world has turned topsy-turvy. Respectable people are being sent off to concentration camps, prisons, and lonely cells, and the dregs that remain govern young and old, rich and poor. One person walks into the trap through the black market, a second through helping the Jews, or another who'd thought to have gone underground Anyone who isn't a member of the NSB doesn't know what may have happened to him from one day to another. This man is a great loss to us, too. The girls can't and aren't allowed to haul along our share of potatoes, so the only thing to do is eat less. I will tell you how we shall do that. It's certainly not going to make things any pleasanter. Mummy says we shall cut our breakfast out altogether, have porridge and bread for lunch, and for supper fried potatoes and possibly... Once or twice a week, vegetables or lettuce, nothing more. We're going to be hungry, but anything is better than being discovered. Yours, Anne. So this is a really serious journal entry for me. This makes me all kinds of sad and anxious and, and worried. And, you know, people can't stay in a crisis situation forever. They can't stay in that kind of, like, heightened anxiety and and, you know, under the thumb of oppressive governance forever. And so what's happening, in my opinion, is that things are getting um, really bad because it's been such a long time and there's been no intervening action. There's been nobody to stop it or to decelerate it. In fact, um, at this point in, you know, May of 1944, Hitler's final solution and um, the 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 pace of concentration camps and the slaughter of the Jews is really at a high, high pitch right now. Um, she doesn't know it, but the Allies are, are beating down Hitler's door, and he has promised that he will, even if he loses the war, he will fulfill his promise of eradicating all the Jews and anyone who is a sympathizer or anyone who helps them. So he's making good on that promise with the help of his um, SS and the help of his Nazi regime and his um, Luthuwafa and things, everything is is helping this maniacal dictator to exact his plan and um, it's going really fast at this point and that's why Anne's feeling what they're feeling. I mean, I can't even imagine. So I'm going to move on to the next journal entry, but I think you'll see that the feeling is mostly the same. It's Friday the 26th of May, 1944. Dear Kitty, at last I can sit quietly at my table in front of a crack of a window and write you everything. I feel so miserable. I haven't felt like this for months. Even after the burglary, I didn't feel so utterly broken. On the one hand, the vegetable man, the Jewish question which is being discussed minutely over the whole house, the invasion delay, the bad food, the strain, the miserable atmosphere, my disappointment in Peter, and on the other hand, Ely's engagement, Whitson reception, flowers, Crayler's birthday, fancy cakes, and stories about cabarets, films, and concerts. That difference, that huge difference, it's always there. One day we laugh and we see the funny side of the situation, but the next we are afraid, fear, suspense, and despair staring from our faces. Meep and Crayler carry the heaviest burden of the eight in hiding. Meep in all she does and Crayler through the enormous responsibility, which is sometimes so much for him that he can hardly talk from pent-up nerves and strain. Hoofius and Eli look after us well, too, but they can forget us at times, even if it's only for a few hours or a day or even two days. They have their own worries. Hoofius over his health, Eli over her engagement, 
which is not altogether rosy, but they also have their little outings, visits to friends, and the whole life of ordinary people. For them, the suspense is sometimes lifted, even if it's only for a short time, but for us, it never lifts, not even for a moment. We've been up here for two years now. How long have we still to put up with this almost unbearable, ever-increasing pressure? The sewer is blocked, so we mustn't run water, or rather only a trickle. When we go to the WC, we have to take a laboratory brush with us, and we keep dirty water in a large cologne pot. We can manage for today, but what do we do if the plumber can't do the job alone? The municipal scavenging service doesn't come until Tuesday. Leap sent us a current cake made up in the shape of a doll with the words Happy Wits on, on the note attached to it. It's almost as if she's ridiculing us. Our present frame of mind and our uneasiness can hardly be called happy. The affair of the vegetable man has made us more nervous. You hear shh, shh from all sides again, and we're being quieter over everything. The police forced the door there so they could do it to us, too. If one day we, too, should... No, I mustn't write it. But I can, but I can't put the question out of my mind today. On the contrary, all the fear I've already been through seems to face me again in all its frightfulness. This evening at eight o'clock, I had to go to the downstairs laboratory all alone. There was no one down there as everyone was listening to the radio. I wanted to be brave, but it was difficult. I always feel much safer here upstairs than alone downstairs in that large, silent house alone with the mysterious muffled noises from upstairs and the tooting of motor horns in the street. I have to hurry, for I start to quiver if I even begin thinking about the situation. Again and again I ask myself, would it not have been better for all of us if we'd not gone into hiding, and if we were dead now, and not going through all this misery, especially as we shouldn't be running our protectors into danger anymore? But we all recoil from these thoughts, too, for we still love life. We haven't yet forgotten the voice of nature. We still hope, hope about everything. I hope something will happen soon now, shooting if need be. Nothing can crush us more than this restlessness. Let the end come, even if it's hard. Then at least we shall know whether we're finally going to win through or go under. Yours, Anne. This entry just makes me so sad. I mean, like I said before, you. It's, it's hard. It's, it's terribly difficult for people to live in uncertain times, in uncertainty for long periods of time. Um, two years is a long time for her not to know whether Hitler and the SS are going to get her or not, or whether her protectors will be found out and held captive. To, to not know whether you're going to live or die, it's too long. It's too long to live under such strain and such emotional strain and she's starting to buckle under it and I just feel so sad that they that you know they they still have lives to live they still have things to do they still have dreams and futures and they want to live their lives still I mean that's a human instinct to live and they just are ready for anything else to happen now even if that's violence and the fight in the end so I'm going to skip two journal entries. They're short ones. I'm just going to flip the page and move to Tuesday, the 6th of June, 1944. This is a big one. Dear Kitty, this is D-Day, came the announcement over the English news, and quite rightly, this is the day the invasion has begun. The English gave the news at 8 o'clock this morning. Calais, Boulogne, La Habra, Charbourg, also the Paste Calis, as usual, were heavily bombarded. However, as a safety measure for all occupied territories, all people who live within a radius of 35 kilometers from the coast are warned to be prepared for bombardments. If possible, the English will drop pamphlets one hour beforehand. According to German news, English parachute troops have landed on the French coast. English landing craft are in battle with the German Navy, says the BBC. We discussed it over at the annex breakfast at nine o'clock. Is this just a trial landing like the yep, two years ago, English broadcast in German, Dutch, French, and other languages at 10 o'clock. The invasion has begun. That means the real invasion. English broadcast in German at 11 o'clock. Speech by the Supreme Commander, General Dwight Eisenhower. The English news at 12 o'clock in English. This is D-Day. General Eisenhower said to the French people, Stiff fighting will come now, but after this, the victory. 
The year 1944 is the year of complete victory. Good luck. English News and English at 1 o'clock translated. 11,000 planes stand ready and are flying to and fro nonstop, landing troops and attacking behind the lines. 4,000 landing boats plus small craft are landing troops and material between Charbourg and Le Havre incessantly. English and American troops are already engaged in hard fighting. Speeches by Gerbrandy, by the Prime Minister of Belgium, King Hakon in Norway, the Gallier of France, the King of England, and last but not least, Winston Churchill. Great commotion in the secret annex would the long-awaited liberation that has been talked of so much, but still seems too wonderful, too much like a fairy tale. Will it ever come true? Could we be granted victory this year, 1944? We don't know yet, but hope is revived within us. It gives us fresh courage and makes us strong again. Since we must put up bravely with all the fears, privatizations, and sufferings, the great thing now is to remain calm and steadfast. Now, more than ever, we must clench our teeth and not cry out. France, Russia, Italy, and Germany, too, can all cry out and give vent to their misery, but we haven't the right to do that yet. Oh, Kitty, the best part of the invasion is that I have been feeling that friends are approaching. We have been oppressed by those terrible Germans for so long, they've had their knives so at our throats that the thought of friends and delivery fills us with confidence. Now it doesn't concern the Jews anymore. No, it concerns Holland and all occupied Europe. Perhaps, Margot says, I may yet be able to go back to school in September or October. Yours, Anne. P.S. I'll keep you up to date with the latest news. So you can hear the excitement in her voice. You can hear how much she is just waiting. Now, it's 1944, May of 1944, or sorry, June, June of 1944, and you know that D-Day's not the end. The end of the war is 1945. Um, it must be so hard to be so close and to be so, be so long in waiting for the end of the war. Um, now, she thinks it could end any minute, any day, and that they'll be free and liberated, and she can go back to school in a few months. Um, boy, that's feeling like a little bit uh, COVID-19-ish for me, at least a little bit. I'm wondering, when can I go back to school? When can I go back to school? Is it going to be, can I go back in September? Um, you know, it, it, my situation is nowhere near, nowhere near as dire or as um, anticipated or as serious as Anne Frank's. But it does remind me of, like, the psyche of people when they are, you know, waiting for something and they don't know when or if it's ever going to come. So um, I just feel bad. I, I know what the outcome of D-Day is. And the, th the most interesting thing, I I have this other unit that I teach. Um, sometimes I, I teach Eli Weishaus Night and um, some other Holocaust literature. And I went to a teacher training um, from uh, what's the, is it Facing History. And um, basically, one interesting thing they told me was that, you know, Holocaust literature is interesting because you have to keep remembering that they didn't know the end of the story. They didn't know how it was going to turn out. They didn't know the end game. We can look back on them in our, you know, comfortable spot far in the future of history and look back at them and say, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Couldn't they see where that was going? No, they couldn't because they were living it moment to moment, day to day, just like you and I don't know what's going to become of coronavirus, global pandemic, and, you know, nationwide quarantine. We don't know the end of that story. And they didn't know the end of theirs. And Anne certainly didn't know the end of hers on D-Day. She thinks D-Day's the day. The done day. So I don't have time for another journal entry today. <laughs> I took a little too long there at the end, but that's okay. Um, and we'll just pick it up there again tomorrow. We're getting near the end of the book. See where we are? How much we've read? How much we've left to go? We're getting close to the end. So um, we will talk more tomorrow. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Have a good day.